Hey class, uh, it's Mr. Gittner. You're seeing this video uh, either one, because you missed class on the day we were talking about this, or two, um, because you are awesome and you read through the announcement on the asynchronous lesson for the B group, or three, um, I don't know, you decided to explore. Uh, anyway, I made this because I'm I got my second COVID shot and like, I have a pretty nasty fever. So I, I hope that you get something out of this. I wanted to read the chapter spin aloud to you and that might be backwards for you. Um, wait, let me, I think I can fix that. I read the chapter spin um, because it's a good chapter to read out loud. All right, guys, uh, here's what we're really gonna focus on for this chapter. We're gonna focus on, for pages 30 to 31, the juxtaposition. Keep in mind, these pages that I'm talking about are in the book. If you didn't get the book, then you're going to want to click on this link in slide 11, and you'll get a link, and you'll get this. Um, later on, we're gonna notice the games motif and meet Tim O'Brien's daughter, and then we're gonna ask like about the 43 years old, and the answer is not 42. To this one all right so again by now you should have read the things they carried and love think of those as an intro and spin with the crux of the book in this first part pay attention to the juxtaposition and the different timelines so we're going to start the war wasn't all terror and violence sometimes things could almost get sweet for instance i remember a little boy with a plastic leg i remember how he hopped over to azar and asked for a chocolate bar gi number one the kid said, and Azar laughed and handed over the chocolate. When the boy hopped away, Azar clucked his tongue and said, War's a bitch. He shook his head sadly. One leg, for Christ's sake. Some poor fucker ran out of ammo. I remember Mitchell said, <laughs> you can pause there, by the way, to appreciate how messed up that is. Uh, it, we're not a fan of Azar. You'll like him even less later. I remember Mitchell Sanders sitting quietly in the shade of an old banyan tree. He was using a thumbnail to pry off the body lice, working slowly, carefully depositing the lice in a blue USO envelope. His eyes were tired. It had been a long two weeks in the bush. After an hour or so, he sealed up the envelope, wrote free in the upper right-hand corner, and addressed it to his draft board in Ohio. On occasions, the war was like a ping pong ball. He could put fancy spin on it. He could make it dance. I remember Norman Bowker and Henry Dobbins playing checkers every evening before dark. It was a ritual for them. They would dig a foxhole and get the board out and play long, silent games as the sky went from pink to purple. The rest of us would sometimes stop by to watch. There was something restful about it, something orderly and reassuring. There were red checkers and black checkers. The playing field was laid out in a strict grid, no tunnels or mountains or jungles. You knew where you stood. You knew the score. The pieces were out on the board. The enemy was visible. You could watch the tactics unfolding into larger strategies. There was a winner and a loser. There were rules. I'm 43 years old and a writer now, and the war has been over for a long time. Much of it is hard to remember. I sit at this typewriter and stare through my words and watch Kiowa sink in, into the deep muck of a shit field or Kurt Lemon hanging in pieces from a tree. And as I write about these things happening, the remembering is turned into a kind of rehappening. Kiowa yells at me. Kurt Lemon steps from the shade in the bright sunlight, his face brown and shining, and then he soars into a tree. The bad stuff never stops happening. It lives in its own dimension, replaying itself over and over. But the war wasn't always that way. Like when Ted Lavender went too heavy on the tranquilizers. How's the war today? Somebody would say. And Ted Lavender would give a soft, spacey smile and say, Mellow man, we got ourselves a nice mellow war today. Now, just like stop for a second. And I want you to really appreciate some of the stuff here. Whoops. All right, I really want you to take a look at that juxtaposition, particularly the different timelines. Notice how we jumped from the present, right as this book is being written, to the past, or excuse me, we started in the past, and then jumped back to the present. Also notice Ted Lavender is alive again. He's been brought back to life again for this chapter, right? He died like seven times in the first chapter and he's brought back to life again, just so he could say we got a nice mellow war today. Just so the author could stop thinking about the bad stuff 
that never stops happening. It lives in its own dimension, replaying itself over and over. So I should say speaker, um, just so the speaking can stop that. Like, notice how we go from a series of tiny stories to like one kind of zoomed out view and then back to a series of tiny stories. Just take a second and like notice maybe with the people around you, like what, what might that juxtaposition indicate to you? That juxtaposition of timelines and that juxtaposition of tone. Right? It's a far cry from people were playing checkers to the bad stuff never stops happening. It lives in its own dimension, replaying itself over and over. And then again, the quick jump, but the war wasn't always that way. You can pause the video, take a few minutes. When the class gives you the thumbs up, just like, go for it. All right, I'm assuming you unpause me. Um, let's keep going, we're on page 32. And like the time we enlisted an old Papasan to guide us through the minefields out in the Batagan Peninsula, the old guy walked with a limp slow and stooped over, but he knew where the safe spots were and where you had to be careful. There we go. And we, where even if you were careful, you could end up like popcorn. He had a tight rope walker's feel for the land beneath him. It's, sur it's surface tension, the give and take of things. Each morning, we'd form up in a long column, the old Papa San out front, and for the whole day, we'd troop along after him, tracing his footsteps, playing an exact and ruthless game of follow the leader. Rat Kylie made up a rhyme that caught on. We'd all be chanting it together. Step out of line, hit a mine, follow the dink, and you're in the pink. All around us, the place was littered with bouncing beddies and toe poppers and booby-trapped artillery rounds, but in those five days on the Batagan Peninsula, nobody got hurt. We all learned to love the old man. It was a sad scene when the chopters came to take us away. Jimmy Cross gave the old Papa San a hug. Mitchell Sanders and Lee Strunk loaded him up with boxes of sea rations. There were actually tears in the old guy's eyes. Follow Dink, he said to each of us. You go pink. If you weren't humping, you were waiting. I remember the monotony, digging foxholes, slapping mosquitoes, the sun and the heat and the endless patties, even in the deep bush where you could die any number of ways. The war was nakedly and aggressively boring, but it was a strange boring. It was a boredom with a twist, the kind of boredom that caused stomach disorders. You'd be sitting at the top of a high hill, the flat patties stretching out below, and the day would be calm and hot and utterly vacant, and you'd feel the boredom dripping inside you like a leaky faucet, except it wasn't water. It was a sort of acid, and with each little droplet, you'd feel the stuff eating away at important organs. You'd try to relax. You'd uncurl your fists and let your thoughts go. Well, you'd think, this isn't so bad. And right then you'd hear gunfire behind you and your nuts would fly up your throat and you'd be squealing pig squeals. That kind of boredom. I feel guilty sometimes. 43 years old and I'm still writing war stories. My daughter Kathleen tells me it's an obsession that I should write about a little girl who finds a million dollars and spends it all on a Shetland pony. In a way, I guess, she's right. I should forget it. But the thing about remembering is that you don't forget. You take your material where you find it, which is in your life, at the intersection of past and present. The memory traffic feeds into a rotary up on your head where it goes in circles for a while. Then pretty soon imagination flows in and the traffic merges and shoots off down a thousand different streets. As a writer, all you can do is pick a street and go for a ride, putting things down as they come to you. That's the real obsession. All those stories. Not bloody stories necessarily, happy stories too, and even a few peace stories. Now let's just take a second, like, once again, we had the same kind of thing where we had a juxtaposition between like boredom and then action, right? Where the boredom is like the anticipation before. We had, you know, the mention of a game, just like checkers before. So like, again, we're noticing those juxtapositions. Let's go to a quick peace story. Here's a quick peace story. A guy goes AWOL, shacks up in Danang with a Red Cross nurse. It's a great time. The nurse loves him to death. The guy gets whatever he wants, whenever he wants it. The war's over, he thinks, just nooky and new angles. But then one day, he rejoins his unit in the bush. He can't wait to get back into action. Finally, one of his buddies asks what happened with the nurse. Why so hot for combat? And the guy says, all that peace, man. It felt so good, it hurt. I want to hurt it back. I remember Mitchell Sanders smiling as he told me that story. Most of it he made up, I'm sure, but even so, it gave me a quick truth goose, because it's all relative. 
you're pinned down in some filthy hellhole of a paddy getting your ass delivered to kingdom come but then for a few seconds everything goes quiet you look up and see the sun and a few puffy white clouds and the immense serenity flashes against your eyeballs the whole world gets rearranged and even though you're pinned down by a war you've never felt more at peace what sticks to memory often are those odd little fragments that have no beginning and no end. Norman Bowker lying on his back one night, watching the stars, then whispering to me, I'll tell you something, O'Brien, if I could have one wish, anything, I'd wish for my dad to write me a letter and say it's okay that I don't win any medals. That's all my old man talks about, nothing else, how he can't wait to see my goddamn medals. Or Kiowa teaching a rain dance to Rado Kiley and Dave Jensen, the three of them whooping and leaping around barefoot while a bunch of villagers looked on with a mixture of fascination and giggly horror. Afterward, Rat said, so where's the rain? Kiowa said, the earth is slow, but the buffalo is patient. And Rat thought about it and said, yeah, but where's the rain? Or Ted Lavender adopting an orphan puppy feeding it from a plastic spoon and carrying it in his rucksack until the day Azar strapped the puppy to a Claymore anti-personnel mine and squeezed the firing device. The average age in our platoon, I guess, was 19 or 20, and as a consequence, things often took on a curiously playful atmosphere, like a sporting event at some exotic reform school. The competition could be lethal, yet there was a childlike exuberance to it all, lots of pranks and horseplay, like when Azar blew away Ted Lavender's puppy. What's everybody so upset about, Azar said. I mean, Christ, I'm just a boy. See, I told you you would hate Azar, right? But notice here the game's motif and the how it keeps bringing back, like it brought back O'Brien's daughter, right? Um, Kathleen. And like it, how it kept bringing up age, both explicitly and implicitly. And how it kept juxtaposing the like, you know, the, the need for action action the need to go to be at war to be with that unit versus like an almost need for norm normalcy you know like the reality and the intangible need kind of like clashing here not just that who calls it a peace story when it ends with someone saying he wants to declare war on peace all that peace man it felt so good it hurt i want to hurt it back right think about that for a second why do you think those motifs are developed in this chapter and juxtaposed. Take a second. And don't forget, unpause me when you're ready. Like you have control over this. And all right, okay. Take a second. Just think about like why that games motif, why that youth motif, and how those things are juxtaposed with the reality. All right, I hope you unpause me. We're gonna wrap up this chapter. I remember these things too. The damp fungal smell of an empty body bag, a quarter moon rising over the nighttime patties, Henry Dobbins sitting in the twilight, sewing on his new Buck Sergeant stripes, quietly singing, A tisket, a tasket, a green and yellow basket, a field of elephant grass weighted with wind, bowing under the stir of a helicopter's blades, the grass dark and servile, bending low, but then rising straight again when the chopper went away. A red, cl cl a red clay trail outside the village of Mykay a hand grenade, a slim, dead, dainty young man of about 20. Kaya was saying, no choice, Tim. What else could you do? Kaya was saying, right? Kaya was saying, talk to me. 43 years old and the war occurred half a lifetime ago, and yet the remembering makes it now. And sometimes remembering will lead to a story which makes it forever. That's what stories are for. Stories are joining the past to the future. Stories are for those late hours in which night in the night when you can't remember how you got from where you were to where you are. Stories are for eternity, when memory is erased, when there is nothing to remember except the story. Now, just take a second, like, really appreciate that, right? Because at least once in there, he said the stories were made up, right? Henry Dobbins made that story up, I think, or was it somebody else? Or was it a different soldier? Or was it somebody who died and came? Mitchell Sanders, that's who made that story up. But then we start getting into toward the end tim o'brien telling us the start of stories just like in the things they carry he told us he started with the start of the stories and then jumped back to and then eventually like told the full story of ted lavender's death not just from one but from multiple perspectives and then he ended on this paragraph and this is a thing let me hold this up this is a thing 
that is key. I don't know if it's actually showing it reflected. Cool. This is the thing that's important, this paragraph, all right? Because when authors put something at the end, it's not an accident. The most important things are at the beginning and the end. Everything in the middle exists to connect one to the other, even if it doesn't appear to be going in the same direction. Okay. So as you start reading On the Rainy River, like know that you might get the beginning of stories or the middle of other stories, and they might be mishmash because this is this chapter is a speaker trying to tell us a series of stories, trying to share with us like what is real, right? When memory has faded and all the rest is gone is erased, we still have the story. Right? This this book is a series of stories that do build to something. But maybe that something is more dependent on our own perspective. Just like you can put a war on the on, you can put a spin on the war, you can put a spin on the stories of a war. So like know that going forward. Know that as you read on the Rainy River. <laughs>